another episode of Behind the Gate with Scott and Kate. I'm your host tonight, Caitlin Wesley. And before I introduce our special guest, I'm going to um, thank our sponsor, 12 Company Fire and Command and Training. And tonight's guest is a female driver native to PEI, and many of us females look up to her. She has a wicked, outstanding um, stat. So her lifetime, she's got 110 lifetime wins, 135 seconds, 133 thirds, banking almost 200,000, very close. And um, I want to welcome aboard Amber Campbell. Hi, Caitlin. Uh, thanks so much for having me tonight. Um, I've kind of been looking forward to it. Awesome. So before we, uh, you know, get going, I, well, I first want to congrats on your uh, award that I seen that you got. So well done and yeah. definitely something that you definitely deserve. So yeah. congrats on that. Well, thank you so much. Um, you know, <laughs> I guess I'd have to say thank you back. Um, you I guess you were the one that dominated. And uh, I've heard along the lines, there's been a few people echoed with you. But um, I wasn't actually at the awards uh, Friday night. My little one was playing hockey in the Atlantic in Moncton. So I was just watching along and I was listening in and uh, I heard the the spiel going on and the, all the great um, things that were being said about the person. And I'm like, who's this lucky person that's getting this award tonight? And when they announced my name, I, I kind of came to tears. I, I wasn't expecting it and uh, it was pretty honored to get it actually. So thanks again so much for the nomination. Super easy to nominate someone that is uh, so willing to help everybody in the industry. So congrats. Let's um kind of get to know a little bit about you. How did you kind of get into harness racing? <laughs> that's uh that's an easy question. I'm the fourth generation of a family affair, is what I like to call it. Uh, my great grandfather always had horses, trained horses. Uh, my grandfather he owned, trained, drive. He bred a couple. A um, couple of his brothers were involved in it as well. Then came along my dad, and he's heavily involved in it, um, owning, training, driving, being a blacksmith. Uh, then myself, my brother, uh, my dad's brother Rick is also involved, and my dad's other brother Kent is also involved with some, uh, just on the ownership side more than anything. So, yeah, it's it's <laughs> well bred into my family. Let's just put it that way. Um. So you've been driving for a while, and you have been in many exciting races what has been you know one of the ones that really stick out to you for a win per se or being in i've got a couple i've got a couple uh my 100th win and my first stake race both came the same summer on a little trot mare that my dad had around um an owner that we had in the barn for some time along for the ride she was uh a phenomenal stakes candidate that year and I was lucky enough to get to drive her but my 100th win came on her and so did my first stake win I was in the go in the governor's plate constellation with Adkins Hanover I did finish second in that so that was there too and also better than cash I won in 54 and 2 with him here in Charlottetown I owned trained and drove him myself it made me the fastest female driver on the island for I'd say maybe a week till Claire come along and decided she had to go faster so <laughs> You know, those those were all pretty exciting. So yeah, those I'd have to go with those four probably. That's, um, I know your dad is like the true trot man. Like he loves his trotters. Do you prefer trotters over pacers or vice versa? Well, uh my dad is a trot man, more so in his older age than than before. We always we always had pacers growing up. Um, usually, something that was a project of some sort. My dad, my dad's a project man just as much as he's a trot man. Um, that's where his blacksmithing comes in. Um, I don't know. I, I like both, to tell you the truth. Like a uh, pacer, you jump on and they're pretty push button as long as they're good gated. You know what? You put them up in the middle of the race. Um, and if they're good enough, they're going to get you there. And you have to have some tactic, but driving wise, they're pretty, they're pretty good. Um, a trotter, a little different. You want to have them on the muscle all the time. You know what I mean? And, uh, you know, you got to drive them a little more careful. They get a little funky gated sometimes and you got to hang to them. You got to talk them through some things. Um, 
they kind of suit my style a little better, I find, because I'm not quite as aggressive as most of the guys are. So I can be patient with a trotter. Um, and usually if I'm too patient with a pacer, I usually end up getting my butt kicked. <laughs> so, yeah. So I, I like both, really. But, you know, a trotter probably suits my style a little better. So speaking of pacers and trotters, and you've already, you know, kind of mentioned these two horses, but... These horses, you know, when I think of Amber Campbell, I think of, you know, Atkins Hanover and a lot for the front. I think those two horses because you've had such awesome accomplishments with them. Um, can you tell us a little bit about both of those horses and, you know, maybe if they had some fun personalities or how they were on the track? For sure. Um, we'll start with Atkins. He's... Uh... He's been around since he was seven or eight. He came here and he raced pretty well through, you know, the invitationals for quite some time. And at 10, I had trained him back pretty well offspring myself. And we had gotten a couple of qualifiers under his belt. And, you know, his normal drivers were busy with other horses. He was pushing up the age level. So I uh, actually got to drive him from the time he was 10 on. Um, he was a, he's a great horse to drive. He's funny jogging, you know, he'd see something and he'd act like a two-year-old and he'd try to run away or in the barn, he'd put on a grumpy face, but he's a big gentle giant. As many people have seen my kids handle him in the winter circle. The only time you couldn't handle him in the winter circle was if there was a blanket underway because he was deathly terrified of blankets and you held them out in front of him. You didn't dare try to put them over his back, but in a race, he was all racehorse. He, when you turned him into the gate, if you put his nose on the gate, you better be ready to be rolling on out of there. And if you wanted to take him back, you just never let his nose touch the gate. He was, uh, you could take him back and drive him whatever way you want. He was just an all around fantastic horse. I was kind of sad to see him have to retire last year, but he's done his purpose for 14 years. And, um, he was, he was a fantastic horse. And along for the ride was actually, she's a filly that, um, we had with an ownership uh, group. We had, the owner of Along for the Ride had actually owned Park Hill Juggernaut with myself and my father beforehand. And he had actually bred a mare, a trot mare by the name of Jewel Eyre. And um, we lost her mother at four months old. And Along for the Ride then kind of grew up with an old racehorse that we had, Buck Barker, and he kind of became her granddad. So she's been around. She was around the whole time. Um, I got to drive her her first start as a two-year-old. And got along well. We finished third. Uh, and my dad drove her the rest of the year. Then we qualified her as a three-year-old. And my dad came into some health issues. So I was lucky enough to pick up that drive. Um, and we went on, you know, quite a ride. We had five wins. And like I said, that summer, and she gave me my first stake win. She was a moose in the barn. She had... She was walk all over the top of you. She was very friendly. She was very lovable, but she had like, because she was raised by horses, basically, it was you walk where she wanted to walk. You did what she wanted to do. And that's the way she was. But you put her on the racetrack and she was a professional right from the time um, we started with her. So she matured more as a three-year-old and it was fantastic. I got to drive her all the way through, I guess, till the end when we sold her at four and, um, uh, yeah, she was she was quite fun too, and she was one of those ones that you kind of had to keep her on the bit because she could she could get lackadaisy, but she was <laughs> she was a great little bear to drive, that's for sure. Awesome. Um, so you've been in many female challenges. Um, for example, harness the hope. Um, the female drivers challenge that is going to happen here in Truro. What is it like to have those, you know, female only challenges? It is it does it drive you to, you know, want to compete more on the track? Does it get you wanting to, you know, beat the guys more? Like does it help in any way? It it does. They're actually a lot tougher to drive in though because when I drive here on the island, I know most of the guys I'm driving against, right? So you kind of know most of their style and how competitive they are here. But you'll hook into those driving challenges or the driving championships. And I know Claire, and I know Tammy, and I know anybody from here. But I've been lucky enough to get to go to, I raced in Florida in a sweetheart pace. I actually won that. Um, when I was working for Mike McDonald down there with a Maritime Bread in Woodmere, Darling, we won that. Um, 
back some time ago, I was also in the Mildred Williams, which had me driving against ladies from the States, as in Stacey Chiota, ladies from Ontario, out West. Um, I got to meet a ton of great ladies, but you never knew how their driving style was. So I found them very hard because, um, you know, they'd stick horses out earlier than you would expect, or they wouldn't move them. Um, I find you just have to drive as confident as you would typically on every race night and uh, put your horses up close. But I, I really like it because like I say, um, I like meeting all the new women and all the people that do the same stuff I do, where I'm the only one here on the island that does it, and a very few of us here in the Maritimes, right? So right. I think they've, I think they're great. I, I can't wait for Harness to Hope. Like I love, I love the competition Natasha Day brings, and I love beating her. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, and dressing up, and the, yeah. your girls always get into it, so it's always fun to watch. We love it. We love Harness the Hope. Um, it's always just been a charity that we really like, and we do. We like to, if we've got a horse that's quiet enough, that we can dress him up or dress her up in all the pink we can, and my girls love to do the same. Like, a couple of years ago, we had old Sam in your storm, and he was uh, he was very quiet. Um, beautiful horse to have around on and off the track, and we dressed him up is, as a dancer for the girls. So all three of them had matching tutus. They had black shirts, they had leggings, he had his feet painted, you know, it's, we, we love it. And um, I actually think my father's been like leading dressed up driver for, I don't know how many years, even if he's not driving that night, he's got to get out on the track and be dressed up. So yeah, it's, it's great. Okay. Um, like you said, you're the only female driver in PEI. Um, we have four here now in Nova Scotia or three, I'm sorry. Nope. Three Nova Scotia, four in the Maritimes. Is there things that, you know, we as an industry could do to maybe drive more people to be, you know, a female driver? Do you know that that's probably a question I should ask you? Oh. Really back and forth. I should push that back to you because I know why I drive. And when somebody says to me, why don't more women drive? I can't answer for anybody else. I can assume that, you know, most females are in the barn, right? right? And that's where they get recognized for being. And I've noticed that whether it be in Florida when I was there or Ontario when I was there, um, the female does her best work in the barn. And that's where they get recognized for it. And they don't do a lot of track work at all. And I'll tell you what, it took my first training trip to get me to want to drive racehorses. And it was just one training trip is all it took. And before that, I had jogged, I've jogged horses since I was six years old. And jogging is one thing. But when you turn and go the other way and feel the speed, that's when you know you want to do it. And I just think that a lot of a lot of girls don't give themselves the chance, um, whether it's because the trainer has hired riders as such or whatever but um that's the biggest thing is i don't think you see enough girls on the track or enough girls with enough confidence in themselves on the track and the way i look at it is dream big and you're as good as anybody else and if you want to do it you strive to do it absolutely i totally agree and i i can't say because i turned you know prince adam when i started training and Andy sent me out on a miserable day and it was just rain and I'm like you want me to what train this horse a horse that you could never turn the right way you just kind of sat and went with the flow and I went my first training mile with him and I was hooked I was like that's it I want to do every amateur race I want to get my trainers I want to get my drivers I want to be out there and then I set my goals and then said, you know what? Someday it would be so nice to beat Andy in a race. And then it was, I'd love to get behind a gate with Amber Campbell. I said, how much fun that would be just to be, you know, competitive with each other and just go with the flow and have so much fun. And so I know myself, that first training trip, you get hooked. You're like, it's just something there. There is. That, yeah. There is. Like my, the first horse that I trained, she was in our barn. And she had run away on a man the day, the week before. Oh, great. And my dad said to me, you're going to train her this week. You're going to follow me. And at the 7-8 pole, you're going to move out. 
that's how my first training trip went. I beat him, of course, but <laughs> but that was that's how my first, and that's what it was. So it was the week before, a gentleman was going with her, and she ran away on him. And like I said, I've never looked back from that day. And there's, believe you me, there's all kinds of people that say you can't, but you can. Right. You can. Yeah. You just keep. You just keep pushing forward, and you can. Absolutely. That being said, being in the industry for so long and growing up with it, who has kind of been your biggest inspiration with it? Here in the Maritimes, it would be my dad. Um, he's been by my side right from the get-go. I jogged my first horse with him. I still train with him, you know, weekly. We train horses together. They might not, you know, be at the same stable. I'm, I'm, you know, I go up and help him. He helps me. When I need some help shoeing, I go see my dad. If I've got something with some lameness issues, I go see my dad. Claire was always a driver inspiration for me. I looked at it. I look at the things that she's done, whether it's been on the track or off the track, the stuff that she's accomplished. And I've, I've actually lived and worked with Claire. So I know behind the scenes that goes with her and um, yeah, she's inspired me that, you know, you can do it if you want to do it, you know, Mm -hmm. you got to love the animal and you got to love the sport and just keep pushing yourself Um, away from here. I would have to say two older gentlemen, as in John Campbell and Doug Brown were two guys that I thought were phenomenal when I was growing up. And to this day, I still think both of them could drive a racehorse. So yeah, that was, that's kind of my inspiration growing up and, and now. So. Awesome. Um, who would be your biggest cheerleader um, with all your accomplishments on the track? Again, I'd have to say my dad. Um, my mom, when she was alive, you know, she rooted for me a lot. And now that my kids are getting a lot older, they uh, they do a lot of cheering for me too. They'll, uh, you know, we'll throw it the, around the house. We'll say, oh, we're going to put Uncle Brody down to drive. No, we're not, Mommy. You're driving. Or, you know, we'll we'll joke about just stuff like that. And, and they're the big, they come, you know, and if there's a driving challenge on the line, they'll come with some signs and just things that, you know, bring a smile to your face. And, and like I said, my dad, he's, he's a great cheerleader because when things get down, which we all know that they can in this business, um, he kind of reminds me that it only goes downhill for a little bit and it'll come back up the other way. So when the good's going good, he's there to remind me, you know, it's not always going to stay this way, but I'm so glad that you are doing well. And when the things are going bad, they're not going to stay this way. They are going to turn around Amber and, uh, you know, they're going to get better. So he's, he's great. And he's a great fellow to talk to when things are down a little bit. So. Um, do you have any thoughts on, well, actually we just talked about it, how we could get the females involved, but like you said, them on the track. So um, with that being said on the track, we've asked this question a few times to the guy drivers and we know how competitive All of them are on the track, behind the gate, give and goes, everything else. Do you have a real fun competitor that you like to tease, aggravate, get under their skin on the track or, you know, have that fun competitive side with? Well, I'd have to say there's a few guys here. They're all up. They're all great guys. They're all competitive. But man, dear, there's a few of them like to chirp. And my brother being one of them is he's probably the ultimate chirper on and off the racetrack. So every once in a while, I just remind him of a mistake that he made, you know, not so many years ago that cost him a big race. And that usually gets him to, you know, close it for a while. Uh, Adam Murner is always a great guy to have some fun with um, on and off the track. Uh, Mark Campbell, another guy that, you know, is very, very competitive. But, you know, he can he can be a smart aleck sometimes. And if I had to pick the ultimate one, I don't drive against him here in Charlottetown, is Danny Romo. Because, man, dear, could I ever get under his skin when I used to drive a Truro. <laughs> <laughs> and he, he could get riled up. He had a temper. So it was, uh, it was always good. I, I always loved driving against Danny. So before we end the episode, um, I thought it would be fun to do just a quick, you know, fun 10 questions. Fun, however many questions I wrote down. Um, of kind of getting to know you, but in a different way. We know who you are. We know you're a driver, but let's have some fun with this. Sure. The first question is, if you won a trip down south, where would you go? Jamaica. 
Nice. I've been to Cuba. I've been to the Dominican a couple of times. I actually had friends go to Jamaica this year. I had opted out of Jamaica to go on a cruise with my uh, my dad's wife, my stepmom, which was a phenomenal time. But Jamaica is a spot that I really do want to that I want to go to. I love the heat though too. Like the warmer it is for me. <laughs> the better. I'm not much of a winter person. As you'll see, I'll do a lot more barn work in the winter than I do in the summer. <laughs> Love this. What is your all-time favorite restaurant? Wow. I like a lot of restaurants. As you can see by the size of my cheeks, I don't mind eating. Um, I like the keg is a good one. Um, my kids like to take uh, East Side Mario's in for the pasta. We we do that when we're off island. The Olive Garden was a place I really loved when I was in the States. So yeah, those would be my top three for sure. Um, what is the last movie you saw and what would you rate it? Oh, good Lord, Caitlin. Like, we watch... I don't know. I think my, the last one I watched would probably be The Hangover 2, and it was probably the 13th time I've watched it, so I obviously rate it funny enough that we keep we continue to watch it. It's, uh, You know, that's something we usually do in the evenings once the kids go to bed is find some kind of a movie to laugh at, so <laughs> that's probably the last one that I've watched. That's awesome. Um, what is one thing you can't live without? No pickles. <laughs> Maybe that's, that's why I have such a sour face sometimes. I don't know, but I, uh, they, I, there's always there's always a bottle of dill pickles in my fridge. So yeah, we'll go with that. Um, if you had fifty thousand, how would you spend it? I'd probably buy a horse. I'd, actually, I'd probably buy a couple of horses because I don't know if I'd ever want to have one that was worth 50000 because I'd scared I'd have to saran wrap it and bubble wrap every time I raced it. And uh, during the week, I'd probably buy a couple of horses. Uh, yeah, that's that's likely what I'd do with that money. Nice. Um, what superpower would you choose if you could? Be a mind reader. Ooh, yes. Yes. Yep. yep. That would... um, here's a fun one. What Disney character is most like you? Disney. <laughs> I can definitely see that. that yep. That's a good one. Yep. Um, if you had to pick a color that represented you as a person, what color would that be? Oh, wow. <laughs> Neon pink. Because it's loud, it's loud and out there. And that's kind of the way I am. I like that. That's a good question. That's a good answer. I like that. Yep. Elliot told me I'd be yellow, always happy. I was like, well, what if I'm not always happy? Yeah, then I guess you're black then. I was like, <laughs> <laughs> Yellow, yellow would be good. Yellow would be good because there's not very, it's not very often I haven't seen you happy. So that would be a great color for you. But like I say, um, I usually voice my opinions. So, you know, and when I look at neon pink going down the street, I think, wow, that person stands out. So, yeah, I think, I think that's what I'd have to go with. My harness to hope is always, you know, your thing. Maybe. There you go. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you, Amber, for joining me tonight on another episode of Behind the Gate with Scott and Kate. And I just want to remind folks, the upcoming guests we have this week and the following week is Ben Hollingsworth, Kenny Murphy, George Renison, and Mike McGuigan. So don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel so you don't miss out on any of the episodes. And again, thank you to our sponsor, 12 Company Fire and Command. Your sponsorship has been awesome for these episodes. And again, thank you, Amber, for taking your time to join me on an episode. And I'm Caitlin Wesley, and that's a wrap for episode 19. Thanks, Caitlin. Thanks for having me here.